गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन कैन सम वन प्लीज अनम्यूट एंड लेट मी नो इफ माई स्क्रीन इज विजिबल एंड इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एम आई ऑडिबल येस मैम एंड माई स्क्रीन इज ऑल्सो विजिबल राइट येस ओके थैंक यू सो मच so good afternoon everyone uh, my name is oishi and i am a second year phd student in the department of chemistry at iit bombay and i am your pmrf uh, ta for this course applied environmental microbiology sorry there are some network issues from my end today so uh, i might get disconnected at certain points and get connected at another point so uh, you don't need to worry because i'll anyway be uploading all these videos uh, on youtube and all the lecture ppts will also be uploaded so e even if there is any kind of network issue from my side or your side it's fine because you can actually watch these uh, recordings of these sessions uh, later on uh, so today in this uh, today is the 11th uh, week of the live session and uh, we have been having these live sessions for almost uh, two months now two and a half months so in today's live session we'll also be discussing some of the sample questions that will uh, based on the lecture videos of this course npdl course applied environmental microbiology hopefully uh, that will help you solve uh, the current assignments that are due so we'll move on to the first question of today which of the following best describes the difference between metabolomics and adaptomics so which one do you think is the correct answer uh, the options are metabolomics studies small molecules in biological systems while adaptomics focuses on chemical modifications to macromolecules option 2 is uh, metabolomics and adaptomics both focus on chemical modifications to macromolecules but adaptomics is more specific to environmental toxins number 3 is metabolomics and adaptomics both focus on small molecules in biological systems but metabolomics is more specific to environmental toxins and number 4 is that there is no difference between these two terms uh, so what do you think is the correct answer so i want the session to be so can you just speak it out loud i'll have to go back to the google meet and see if you can uh, put put yourself on speaker and see anything so yeah i can see the answer yeah okay okay yeah written yeah see it's correct yeah option a uh, is the correct answer so before moving on uh, we'll learn a little bit about what these terms mean so metabolomics basically is the scientific study of small molecules which are known as metabolites that are present in cells tissues and biological fluids so it involves a comprehensive analysis of the metabolome which is a complete set of metabol metabolites present in a given biological sample uh, at a particular time so you have probably would have heard the omics terms like it's basically a hot topic in today's scientific world genomics means the entire genome at a particular time like genome is will stay same genome of a particular organism proteome will be the entire protein uh, concept at a particular time in the organism transcriptome is the entire transcript uh, whatever rna transcripts are present that that at at a particular time in a particular sample that is what transcriptome is so similarly metabolomics also means something similar it is a complete set of metabolites present in a given biological sample at a particular time this is very specific because obviously the metabolites in a particular sample might change uh, based on treatment or based on exposure to other substances or based on uh, time so that's why saying at a particular time is very important So in today's time, metabolomics is a very powerful tool for understanding the biochemical and physiological processes that occur in living organisms, and it has applications in a wide range of fields, including medicine, agriculture, environmental science, and drug discovery. 
So by measuring and analyzing the metabolites present in a biological sample, researchers can gain insights into the biochemical pathways that are active in the sample, identify biomarkers of disease or environmental exposure, and then monitor the effects of treatments or interventions. So suppose you have a, a particular diseased uh, tissue sample from any, uh, you know, there's samples coming from hospitals every day. So if you have a particular diseased uh, tissue sample and you have another sample which is from a healthy individual and you have to, there's a whole lot of protocol uh, that will, that you find in research papers, the protocol, you have to optimize the protocol on your own also where you can extract the metabolites from the uh, tissues at a particular time point uh, and keep them you know uh, and maintain them in particular conditions maybe temperature wise or anything so that it maintains the integrity that then, then you can basically run the samples on mass spec on mass spec you can do metabolomics analysis so by that you'll be able to know which metabolites are different in the disease and the healthy samples which metabolites are overexpressed, overregulated, uh, overregulated? Which metabolites are downregulated? So from there you can find out that if this metabolite is over overregulated in a disease sample, so that this pathway is altered, or this pathway might be an effective uh, treatment uh, target. So that is why metabolomics is such an important uh, field in today's time. Adaptomics, on the other hand, is a branch of metabolomics that focuses on the identification and quantification of adducts, uh, which are molecules formed by the covalent binding of a reactive compound to a biomolecule, such as DNA, RNA, or proteins. So, adducts can be formed by exposure to environmental uh, toxins, dietary factors, or endogenous metabolites, uh, and they can have adverse effects on cellular function, leading to disease or cancer. So, adaptomics involves the targeted or the untargeted analysis of adducts in a biological sample and it can provide insights into the mechanisms of adduct formation, the sources of exposure and the potential health effects of adducts. So, that's why adaptomics also has a huge role in uh, toxicology, environmental health and cancer biology and it's also an important uh, tool for identifying uh, new biomarkers of exposure and disease. So, metabolomics and adaptomics are two closely related uh, branches of analytical chemistry that are used to study small molecules in biological samples. However, there are some important differences between these two approaches. Metabolomics involves the study of the entire set of small molecules and metabolites present in the biological sample, including both endogenous and exogenous compounds. And metabolomics Basically, its aim is to provide you with a comprehensive picture of the metabolic pathways that are active in biological system and then you can use it to identify you know, biomarkers of disease, monitor the effects of treatments and gain insights into the underlying uh, biological process. So, metabolomics typically uh, involves the use of high throughput analytical techniques such as mass spec which I already mentioned or uh, nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR spectroscopy to measure the levels of different metabolites in biological samples. Adaptomics on the other hand is subfield. It's a subfield of metabolomics, not exactly the same. It's a subfield of metabolomics that focuses specifically on the identification and quantification of adducts, which are covalently bound molecules formed by the reaction uh, of a reactive chemical species with the biomolecules such as DNA, RNA or proteins. And it's particularly useful for studying the effects of exposure to environmental toxins, dietary factors, etc. Basically, anything which can form adducts that may have adverse effects on cellular function and can lead to cancer in the future. So, it can be targeted if you are targeting, if you are looking for targeted analysis for a particular adduct, or it can be untargeted. You are asking the system to tell you all the adducts that have been formed. And it can provide you insights into the sources of exposure, the mechanisms of adduct formation, uh, and the potential health effects of adducts. And it also uses, uh, it also uh, makes use of high resolution mass spectrometry or even other specialized analytical techniques that are capable of, uh, you know, detecting and, uh, and characterizing adduct, adducts. So, in summary, 
metabolomics while metabolomics aims to provide a comprehensive picture of the small molecules present in a biological sample and actomics is a more focused approach that is specifically geared towards the identification and quantification of covalently bound adducts so these were the statements uh, for these questions so the first statement uh, is correct because i've already talked about uh, what metabolomics is and what adactomics is that it studies the chemical modifications of macromolecules such as dna and rna and proteins adactomics i'm talking about adducts are formed when a reactive compound covalently binds to a macromolecule and adactomics involves the identification and quantification of these modified macromolecules so while both of these uh, terms involve the use of analytical high highly advanced analytical techniques they differ in their focus on either small molecules or modified molecules modified macromolecules if that makes sense so yes this statement is correct the second statement uh, is not entirely correct while adactomics uh, does focus on chemical modifications to macromolecules it is not necessarily more specific to environmental toxins it can help you summarize the effect of dietary factors and other factors as well so it is not like it is more specific to environmental toxins so adducts can be formed by a variety of reactive compounds from dietary factors or endogenous metabolites uh on the other hand uh, metabolomics uh, is a much broader field uh that involves the study of small molecules or metabolites in biological systems so while metabolomics can also be used to study the effects of environmental toxins it is not limited to this application so adactomics is a subset of uh, metabolomics but this statement is not correct because it is not it is not specific to environmental toxins both of these techniques can be used to study the effects of environmental toxins but it's not limited or specific to it it can also do a lot of other things the third statement is also not entirely correct uh because both focus on small molecules in biological systems but have different areas of emphasis uh so uh, this is also not correct because uh, uh adactomics also focuses on other things apart from environmental toxins so this statement uh, is also not correct and uh, there is no difference between metabolomics this also an incorrect statement because there are two dis- these are two distinct fields of study uh within analytical chemistry which focuses on different aspects of macromolecules in biological systems so while metabolomics and adactomics uh, are related fields that both focus on small molecules they have different aims application and sometimes even different analytical approaches so yes uh, that is so in a more generic term if you want me to explain imagine a vein diagram uh, with two circles two overlapping circles in a vein diagram wait let me is a pen option over here so if these the, these are uh, this is a venn diagram with two overlapping s- circles I'm sorry for the yeah so imagine this is a venn diagram uh, the first circle represents metabolomics and the second circle represents uh, adactomics yeah so the overlapping region here represents the shared focus on small molecules in biological systems and this metabolomic circle will be larger uh because it represents a comprehensive study of all small molecules or metabolites present in a biological sample including both endogenous and exogenous compounds and it aims to provide a broader overview of the metabolic pathways that are active in a biological system this circle will be comparatively much smaller because it represents a specialized study of covalently bound molecules or adducts formed by the reaction of a reactive chemical species with a biomolecule such as dna rna or proteins and it focuses specifically on the identification and quantification of these modified macromolecules which can be formed by exposure to environmental toxins dietary factors or endogenous metabolites so while these two have overlapping areas of focus on small molecules uh, in biological system metabolomics has a broader scope while adactomics is a specialized subset of metabolomics that focuses uh, specifically on uh, modified uh, macromolecules so 
it also actually focuses on quite diverse applications of chronic uh, i'm talking about atomics it also focuses on some diverse applications such as forecasting the risk of chronic diseases triggered by reactive agents and predicting carcinogenesis induced by tobacco smoking assessing uh, chemical agents toxicity and supplementing genotoxicity studies then designing personalized medication and precision treatment in cancer chemotherapy uh, appraising environmental quality or extent of pollution using biological systems crafting tools and techniques for diagnosis of diseases and detecting food contaminants and furnishing exposure profile of the individual to electrophiles basically characterizing adducts that are present in extremely low concentrations is a very important and very hectic task and moreover absence of a dedicated database to identify these adducts is further you know adding on to the problem of adduct diagnosis so there's a lot of uh, scope of improvement in sample preparation methods and data processing software algorithms for accurate assessment of adducts so that is why electronics has become most prominent technique in recent times and it is one of the rapidly emerging disciplines with the potential to actually dramatically transform the landscape of toxicological research so the time has probably come for electronics to join the you know elite uh, omics worlds like genomics proteomics and metabolomics so this term i think first were appeared in 2006 and currently its application has reached almost all areas of toxicological research because it's a transformational biomedical research tool which utilizes omics approach to characterize and quantify exogenous and endogenous reactive compounds to which the individual is exposed leveraging compound specific uh, adducts biomarkers and chemical exposure is generally driven by various factors such as environmental genetic and lifestyle uh, which are characterized by high level interpersonal variability and incorporates a lifetime component making it unique to every individual so this thing is very unique to in every individual because lifestyle and exposure to different things will be very different from individual to individual chemical exposure is very different so that that's what makes this process all the more unique and uh, since it focuses on the investigation of adducts from from covalent modification which are irreversible in nature with bio bio macromolecules by ex exogenous or endogenous reactive electrophile compounds such as reactive compounds might interact with uh, nucleophilic hot spots susceptible to electrophiles and uh, present in the dna lipids or rna system and other macromolecules leading to formation of ducts and biomonitoring of reactive uh, metabolites regardless of their origin whether exogenous or endogenous is challenging due to their short life in vivo and adductomics basically provided unique opportunity to detect covalent adducts that are relatively stable and long lived so this study basically uh, makes use of two approaches targeted and untargeted uh, while the targeted method focuses on the detection of specific adducts upon exposure to specific chemical agents uh, the untargeted approach will aim to characterize the total adducts through covalent bonding so yes the first answer is uh, correct he was you were correct so we'll move on to the next question how can genomics help study new and reemerging pathogens so these are the four options what do you think is the correct answer by identifying the genetic determinants of pathogen virulence by assisting by assisting uh, in the development of new vaccines and therapies by assisting in tracking the evolution and transmission of pathogens by noting down the ecological factors that contribute to pathogen emergence or all of the above which one do you think is the correct answer anybody one more anybody else yes so the correct answer is all of the above genomics help us uh, do all of these things uh, by doing all of these things basically 
So, uh, genomics can play a very crucial role in studying new and re-emerging pathogens by providing valuable insights into their genetic makeup and evolution. They can help in identifying the pathogen. So, genomics can be used to identify unknown or novel pathogens by sequencing and comparing their genomes with those of known pathogens. This approach can help researchers quickly identify the causative agent of a disease outbreak and develop appropriate diagnostic tests. So whenever a new pathogen uh, takes emergence, like emerges in the environment, you can actually sequence it and if you get to know the entire genome of it, you can uh, put it uh, in put it in the data, like search for hits in the database and you can actually find, uh, if you are able to find hits in the database, then you will be able to see the closest uh, relation of that uh, pathogen. So you can basically figure out uh, by comparing the genomes if they are very similar to an al already known pathogen. So that will help in developing diagnostic tests, basically will help advance the fight against the new pathogen. Also it can understand the pathogen evolution. So genomics can reveal how a pathogen has evolved over time which can provide insights into its origin, transmission, dynamics and potential for adaptation to new hosts or environments. So this information can be used to develop more effective strategies for controlling and preventing the spread of the pathogen. So basically we can uh, create phylogenetic trees and all of that and there is another approach which is known as metagenomics. All of these are very uh, are hot topics in today's field. So by the process of genomics, you can actually figure out uh, the origin, transmission dynamics and potential for adaptation because you are comparing the pathogen, the genome of the new pathogen to all of everything that you have in the database and that will help you in the further processing. Also, you can develop new treatments and vaccines because genomics can help identify new drug targets or vaccine candidates by revealing the genetic basis of pathogen virulence, host specificity and drug resistance. And this can uh, accelerate the development of new therapeutics and preventive measures. It's, it can also track outbreaks because uh, during an outbreak, uh, genomics can be used to track uh, the spread of, an, of a pathogen during an outbreak by sequencing the genomes of isolates collected from different geographic locations or time points and this can help identify the source of the outbreak, trace the transmission pathways and monitor the effectiveness of control measures. So during the COVID time also this came into, uh, uh, this was a huge help because you know that there are very many various, uh, many variants of the uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2. There was this alpha variant, the beta variant, gamma, delta, omicron. Uh, UK variant which I guess is the alpha variant only and all of these variants started out from different geographic locations. I think the delta variant was started in India, the alpha variant started in the UK, uh, the omicron variant uh, China or somewhere I am not really sure. So all of these variants actually the source of these variants are from different places. So how do you think people, scientists actually figure out, figured out where these um, variants started from. So they basically collected isolates. Uh, I understand the symptoms. Sometimes the symptoms might also be a little different. But still, uh, if you are COVID positive, you are COVID positive. How do you know which variant is it, 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 it is? Which mutation has caused that variant? And all of that. For that, people have been doing genomic studies. They have been taking isolates from different geographic locations. And they have been doing analysis on those samples. And that has helped basically to identify the mutations uh, in the uh, genome of the virus, the source of the outbreak and basically trace the transmission pathways. If, if it has a different source of origin, how did it end up in an isolate from in uh, India or Japan? So that is what this entire genomics process can uh, help us with. And in today's time, you can actually understand how important and how uh, significant this entire process and how fast it actually helped us to understand the different variants. So every day there is a new variant, we can actually see it on the news. But how do you think scientists are doing it so fast? So that's what genomic, uh, genome sequencing and genomic studies has helped us achieve. 
uh, and also it has enhanced any kind of surveillance. So genomics can be used to enhance the surveillance of known pathogens by rapidly detecting genetic changes that may affect their virulence or drug resistance. So this can enable early warning of potential outbreaks and inform the design of more effective surveillance and control strategies. So you might be seeing uh, news where you can see that this outbreak can be predicted and all of that. So that is why what genomics have been doing. They can actually, just by knowing the genome of, an organ, of a, a pathogen, they can actually figure out their virulence and drug resistance and if they, these can actually lead to potential outbreaks in any part of the world. So in summary, genomics can provide a lot of valuable insights into the genetics and evolution of new and re-emerging pathogens which can inform the development of more uh, effective strategies for preventing, controlling and treating infectious diseases. So yes, it can, the options was by, yes, it can identify, uh, it can, uh, genomics can help in identifying the genetic determinants of pathogen virulence. Uh, the virulence of a pathogen, which is, its, which is basically its ability to cause a disease, is determined by various genetic factors, including the presence of virulence genes, the regulation of gene expression, and the genetic diversity within a pathogen population. So all of these uh, is possible. So by sequencing and comparing the genomes of pathogen strains with different levels of virulence, researchers can identify genetic variations that are associated with virulence. For example, certain virulence genes or gene clusters may be present only in high, highly virulent uh, strains but not in less virulent strains. Or certain single nucleotide polymorphisms which are SNPs may be enriched in virulent strains. Moreover, genomics can also reveal how pathogen virulence is regulated and modulated at the molecular level. For instance, comparative genomic studies can identify regulatory genes or pathways that control the expression of virulence genes or that are involved in the pathogen host interactions and this information can be further used to develop new therapeutic targets or vaccines that specifically target the molecular mechanisms of pathogen virulence. So overall, genomics can provide a comprehensive understanding of the genetic basis of pathogen virulence which is very crucial for developing effective strategies for preventing, controlling and treating infectious diseases. Also, it can definitely help us, uh, uh, it can assist in the development of new vaccines and uh, therapies. Uh, as I said, it can, it can identify new vaccine targets. So, genomics can reveal new protein targets that are very specific to a pathogen and are essential for its survival, growth or virulence. So, these targets can then be used to design new vaccines that induce a stronger immune response against the pathogen without affecting the host. Also, it can help in designing personalized therapies. So, genomics can help identify genetic variations in the host that affect the susceptibility to a pathogen or response to a treatment. So, this information can also be used to develop personalized therapies that are tailored to the individual's genetic makeup, increasing their effectiveness and reducing the risk of adverse side effects. So, you might know that some individuals might be more susceptible to a pathogen than others. So, in if a pathogen is there in the atmosphere, it will infect you. But some uh, individuals are obviously more prone to the symptoms. If you have seen younger adults, adults like below 30 adults were not really uh, above 18 and below 30 people, I, I didn't see them having a lot of, uh, you know, side of, a lot of uh, symptoms during COVID. Like I'm talking from my personal experience. Uh, there were some people who were a lot affected because of some other uh, diseases that they diseases that they might have. Some might be diabetic from before, and then you're getting infected by the pathogen. So that will just ruin your system inside. Some might be having some kidney issues from before, and if you're infected by the pathogen, then that will ruin everything. So, but yeah, except that this uh, young adults age range was really not that prone to many symptoms. Some people were entirely asymptomatic as well. So some people were carrying the pathogen without even knowing because they did not show any symptoms and only when they were getting tested for travel, something like that. So I, I know this because this happened to one of my friends. She was perfectly fine and she was going on with her duties and everything. So she had to travel to another city in, the, uh, in India and that's when she got tested. 
आर टी पी सी आर एंड दैट वेन दैट्स वेन शी गॉट टू नो दैट शी वॉज एक्चुअली कोविड पॉजिटिव सो हर सी टी वैल्यू वॉज वेरी हाई द स्पेशल वैल्यू वॉज वेरी हाई दैट मीन्स शी वॉज नॉट रियली स्प्रेडिंग द डिजीज टू अदर पीपल वेहमेंटली बट स्टिल शी वॉज कोविड पॉजिटिव बट शी डिट नो दैट बिफोर सो सम पीपल आर नॉट दैट विल नॉट बी शोइंग द सिम्टम्स सो क्लियरली वन ऑफ माई अदर फ्रेंड्स सेम एज रेंज he was like the city value was very low that like he was severely infected and he showed a lot of side side symptoms as also he, he had he was very weak fatigued and all of that he was in the hospital also same age range so because he was already previously uh, infected by some other pathogen during when he was a teenager or something like that so his body immune system is already very weak so that the point that i'm trying to make is that uh, there are some people who will be more prone to a particular pathogen even if you are actually exposed to the same level of the pathogen that's because of your some some the genetic makeup is obviously very important because some diseases are hereditary uh, like people having cardiac issues were also facing more problem uh, during covid-19 some people were uh, having respiratory problems asthma some people who had asthma from before were they were a mess during this pandemic uh, when they were infected by the covid so some of these cardiac issues specifically can be hereditary i think diabetes can also be hereditary some cancer uh, can also be hereditary apart from hereditary things there are also your lifestyle also influences a lot of factors so if you are al- always uh, having a very unhealthy diet uh, very unhealthy way of living life always smoking and something like that that will also like um, add on to the uh, chances of getting a particular disease so the what is what do you mean by personalized therapy so genomics can actually help identify these kind of genetic variations in the host uh, that affect the susceptibility to a pathogen or response to a treatment so some people might be uh, responding to a treatment much better than some other people and some people might be getting more susceptible to a disease more than other people even if i'm keeping the lifestyle uh, aspect separate the genetic factors also have a huge influence so this genetic factor this information because now even he, after the human genome project even human the entire human genome can be sequenced easily not easily like it can be sequenced it is possible so the entire human genome project is complete so this information if you get yourself sequenced so this information can be used to develop personalized therapies that are tailored to the individual genetic makeup increasing their effectiveness and reducing the risk of adverse side effects so this is not something that you give to everyone the not the kind of treatment that is given to everyone because you are actually analyzing the genome of that particular individual so i want you to appreciate what how far the genomics study has come since the human genome project completion and since everything so even in pandemics people have uh, all science has advanced so much so it can actually now lead to now actually help you in get, getting personalized therapies based on your genome sequence so i think that is very cool apart from that uh, development of new antimicrobial agents so genomics can also help identify new targets for antimicrobial agents including enzymes or metabolic pathways that are unique to the pathogen so this can help in the development of new drugs that specifically target the pathogen without affecting the host so you see you can uh, sequence the particular pathogen and you can help identify new targets and that will help you basically design and create new antimicrobial agents so that when you inject into a individual it will take care to not have any side effect on the individual but it will only kill the pathogen i mean how cool is that and then prediction of drug resistance so genomics can help predict the emergence of drug resistance genes by identifying genetic variations that confer resistance to specific drugs and this can inform the selection of appropriate drug con- combinations or the development of new drugs that are effective against drug resistance genes so you might have heard about the type uh, term amr or antimicrobial resistance which is basically how most antibiotics are failing in today's time because the bacteria all most of the bacteria are becoming resistant to the antibiotic so one of the uh, very uh, prominent causes behind this is people not completing their dose of antibiotic and people not consulting their doctors before taking in antibiotics so this is a very in the uh, this is still a hot topic in today's time in the next 5 10 years accordingly according to me i think this will be a 
very hugely researched field because most of the bacteria they don't respond to the antibiotics anymore so you can feel how dangerous that is because now you don't have any way to control the infection in your body and that happens because people don't consult doctors and take antibiotics without consulting medical professionals and even if they start taking the antibiotic they stop it between once they start feeling good they think that i don't need this medicine anymore so i stop taking it that's not the right attitude because now the even the bacterial infection has subdued in your body but it has not been killed exactly it has not been killed entirely so now the bacteria gets chance to you know uh, modify its genetic uh, components and figure out different uh, pathways and figure out different ways to basically uh, start being resistant to the antibiotic so this is how antimicrobial drug resistance is coming up so genomics can also help in predicting these uh, drug resistance strains because they can identify these genetic variations that might confer resistance to the antibiotics and that will help them figure out like a uh, design more like more uh, effective antibodies in the future also genomics can also help you monitor vaccine efficacy so by tracking changes in the genetic makeup of pathogen populations over time so this can actually help identify vac vac vaccine breakthroughs uh, vac vaccine breakthroughs that can happen and of the emergence of new strains that are not covered by the existing vaccines so in summary genomics can uh, provide valuable insights into the genetic makeup of pathogens and the interaction with the host which can inform the development of new vaccines and therapies for infectious diseases also it can definitely help you by assisting in tracking uh, evolution and transmission of pathogens it can genomic analysis can provide an a detailed information on the genetic makeup of pathogen populations including their diversity relatedness and geographical distribution so they can also help identify the outbreak sources so genomic analysis can identify the origin of an outbreak of an outbreak by comparing the genomes of pathogen isolates from different locations or time points and this can help identify the source of the outbreak and prevent further transmission which was very evident during covid that's why there are so many variants and you know some of the variants have originated from particular countries this, this genomics can also help you track transmission routes uh within and be, within and between populations by comparing the genomes of pathogen isolates from different individuals or locations and also this can help identify the transmission routes uh, transmission routes hotspots inform public health interventions and monitor the effectiveness of control measures it can also detect emerging strains uh, uh it emerge it can detect the emergence of new strains or variants of a pathogen by comparing the genomes of isolates from different regions and this can then monitor the spread and evolution of pathogen over time and inform the selection of uh, appropriate control measures also it can identify drug resistant strains definitely uh, because they can actually identify the genetic variations that will confer resistance uh, to specific drugs allowing the detection of drug resistant strains and the selection of the appropriate treatments so genomics can provide valuable insights into evolution and transmission of pathogen which can inform public health interventions and improve disease surveillance and control also it can definitely help uh, by noting down the ecological factors uh, it can genomics can help identify the ecological factors that contribute to pathogen emergence uh, because as you know pathogens can emerge as a result of various ecological factors such as changes in land use deforestation climate change human migration and population growth all of these factors are very responsible for emergence of new pathogens and genomic analysis can provide insights into the genetic diversity adaptation and transmission of pathogens in response to these ecological factors so they can identify the host range uh, genomic analysis can identify the host a range of hosts that a pathogen can infect and how it adapts to different hosts this can help identify potential reservoirs of the pathogen and inform disease surveillance and control also they can track pathogen uh, evolution uh, over time including the acquisition of new genetic traits that enhance its virulence transmission or adaptation to new hosts or environments and this can help identify genetic factors that contribute to pathogen emergence and inform disease control strategies 
Also, uh, genomic analysis can characterize the diversity and the composition of microbial communities in different environments, such as soil, water, and animals. And this can help identify the potential sources of pathogen transmission and inform disease surveillance and control. And it can also predict uh, disease risk. Uh, so genomic analysis can predict the emergence of new pathogens or disease outbreaks based on environmental factors such as climate change and land use and they can actually help in uh, creating better strategies. So yes, genomics can also provide valuable insights into the ecological factors. So apart from genomics, even bioinformatics is increasingly uh, contributing to the understanding of infectious diseases caused by bacterial pathogens. Some examples can be mycobacterium tuberculosis. It also parasites uh, it also helps in the detection of parasites such as Plasmodium falciparum. So this ranges from the investigation of the disease outbreaks and pathogenesis and host and pathogen genomic variation and host immune evasion mechanism to identification of the potential diagnostic markers and vaccine targets. And high throughput uh, genomics data generated from pathogens in animal models can then be combined with host genomics and patient's health records to give advice on treatment options as well as potential drug and vaccine interactions. However, despite accounting for the highest burden of infectious diseases, Africa has the lowest uh, research output on infectious disease uh, genomics. If you go online and search, there are a lot of uh, review papers where you'll be able to see the contributions of gene genomics and infectious diseases to the management of infectious diseases in uh, of serious public health concern in Africa, including TB, dengue fever, malaria, and filariasis. So, from like in, during, due to the advancement of science, genomics and bioinformatics have increased our understanding and mostly have led us to this level today. And you can actually find papers where they review how uh, some of the major contributions to genomics and bioinformatics in infectious diseases uh, using examples of diseases as a mycobacterium tuberculosis, dengue virus, and also the parasite Plasmodium falciparum. So, any kind of omics of tuberculosis, tuberculosis pathogens and uh, like tuberculosis caused by members of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis simplex is a leading cause of death. We know with about I think nine million cases and two million deaths per year globally. And even though the mycobacterial genome was first sequenced in 1998 and many more uh, M. tuberculosis genome have since been sequenced, these genomes still take time to provide like you know, answers to the questions that people are looking for today. And these genomes provide great avenues for the genomic characterization, development of improved diagnostic tools, drug susceptibility testing and molecular epidemiology of circulating mycobacterial strains. So host pathogen genomics Transcriptomies have over the past decade, you know, enhanced our understanding of the human mycobacterium inter interactions and in the identification of potential diagnostic and uh, prognostic mar markers. So, an understanding of the mycobacterium tuberculosis genome biology is invaluable in the control of TB. So, now after the genome has been sequenced, we know that the mycobacterium tuberculosis genome is GC rich, guanine cytosine rich, and consists of about 4,000 genes. And unlike any other bacteria, a large population of its genomes encodes proteins and enzymes involved in lipolyse, uh, lipogenesis and uh, lipolysis, reflecting its thick uh, lipid cell wall. Then TB control is hampered by antimicrobial resistance, which I talked about. There is multi-drug resistance and extensively drug-resistant mycobacterial strains. So genomic analysis has immensely contributed to the identification of drug resistance, conferring mutations and surveillance. So whole genome analysis have demonstrated that mycobacterial drug resistance is largely attributed to single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are SNPs. For example, rifampicin is an, anti is an antibiotic. So rifampicin resistance arises from mutations in a gene known as the RPOB gene and mutations in the CAD G and the INHA gene lead to isoniazid uh, resistance. The newly characterized genetic mutations in these genomes have also been shown to you know, play uh, massive roles in the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. So there are a lot of uh, like resistant drugs uh, that have come into the picture. 
so i want you to understand that when i'm talking about genomic uh, sequence that's just atgc if i'm talking about dna and dna only has adenine guanine uh, cytosine and uh, thymine right in uh, rna it's thymine is not there uracil is there so when i'm talking about genome sequencing only these four nucleotides and an entire genome sequence and but just by you know finding out the sequence of these four nucleotides you can actually do so much do th- this many things and in act- actually help uh, advance medical studies to so much so i think that is something that should be appreciated so yes the answer will be all of the above so all of these answers are correct options are correct so yes these are the various uh, techniques uh, and various purposes of uh, genome sequencing how these can help uh, in today's time so we'll move on to the next question uh, match the following endemic epidemic pandemic and outbreak so this global is a part of this option this option so uh, which one do you think is the correct match and pair choice anybody wish to think is the correct option okay so this is the correct option uh, but before that let's find out what endemic and all these terms mean and what is the difference so endemic when a disease is endemic it means that the disease is present and consistently maintained at low to moderate occurrence in populations around the world and endemicity refers to the ongoing usual or expected presence of a disease within a geographic area or population group for example malaria is endemic in many parts of sub saharan africa uh, southeast asia and south america meaning that the disease is consistently present in these regions and is a significant public health concern similarly hepatitis b is endemic in many parts of asia and africa meaning that the disease is present at a high level in these regions and is a major cause of liver disease and cancer so it is important to note that endemicity can vary by region and population group a disease that is endemic in one region may not be endemic in another and some populations may have higher rates of disease than others due to factors such as genetics socio economic status and environmental factors so endemic refers to the ongoing usual or expected presence of a disease or infection within a geographic area population group uh as i already talked about the examples of malaria similarly dengue fever is endemic in many parts of southeast asia and latin america meaning that the disease is present at a high level in these regions and is a major cause of morbidity and mortality and endemicity can actually be influenced by various factors such as environmental conditions population density vector abundance uh, and socio economic status and endemic diseases have can have significant health economic and social impacts on affected populations and often require ongoing public health interventions to control or prevent their spread let's move on to epidemic epidemic refers to the occurrence of an infectious disease that spreads rapidly and affects a large number of individuals within a population or geographic area during a short period of time so an epidemic may occur within a new infectious when a new infectious agent is introduced into a population or when an existing infectious agent suddenly increases in virulence or changes in its mode of transmission for example the ebola virus outbreak in west africa uh in 2014 2016 was an epidemic because it rapidly spread across multiple countries infecting thousands of people and causing significant mortality and similarly the covid-19 pandemic which began in 2019 is an ongoing global epidemic caused by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 so at that time it was a pandemic now it's it, it is now 
can be termed as an ongoing global epidemic. So epidemic can be challenging to control and may require public health interventions such as contact tracing, quarantine and vaccination campaigns. And the severity of an epidemic can vary depending on factors such as the virulence of the infectious agent, the susceptibility of the population and uh, geographical location and the effectiveness of the public health measures in controlling its spread. Pandemic, we all know. Pandemic is the we have gotten really familiar with since the last two, three years. I can't believe it's three years since the pandemic. Uh, so pandemic refers to an outbreak of an infectious disease that occurs over a wide geographic area, often affecting multiple countries or continents and usually affecting a large number of people. So a pandemic occurs when a new virus or infectious agent emerges and spreads easily from person to person. Like basically, it's very infectious and contagious, causing significant illness and mortality. For example, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic, which began in 2019 December in China, in the Yuhan district of China, and it caused a global pandemic caused by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. And the virus quickly spread from its initial outbreak in China to affect multiple countries and continents, causing significant illness and mortality worldwide. So pandemics can have significant social, economic and public health impacts. They may require large-scale public health interventions such as quarantine, social distancing and vaccination campaigns to control their spread. And pandemics can also lead to significant economic disruption and social unrest as seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. I think we all are very aware. So what what is an outbreak then? An outbreak refers to the sudden occurrence of cases of a particular disease or infection in the geographic area or population group that is higher than the expected number of cases for that area and population at that time. An outbreak can range in size from a small cluster of cases to a larger event that affects a whole community or region. For example, an outbreak of measles in a school could involve several students and staff members being infected over a short period of time, whereas an outbreak of food poisoning in a city could involve hundreds of individuals becoming sick after consuming contaminated food. And outbreaks can be caused by a variety of factors, including the introduction of a new infectious agent, changes in the environment or population, or breakdowns in the public health uh, measures. Outbreaks can be controlled through public health interventions such as contact tracing, quarantine, and vaccination campaigns. And the severity and the duration of an outbreak can vary depending on the nature of the infectious agent, the susceptibility of the population, and the effectiveness of public health measures in controlling its spread. So, epidemic, endemic, pandemic, and outbreak are these terms used to describe the spread of diseases and they differ how they differ in their scope of uh, severity. So, these are the this is the correct answer. And to summarize it all, an endemic disease is one that constantly present that is constantly present in a particular geographic area or population. In other words, the disease is always present in the population and the number of cases may fluctuate, but is generally stable over time. Examples of endemic diseases include malaria in the sub-Saharan Africa, dengue fever in parts of Asia and Latin America, and Lyme disease in parts of the United States. Epidemic An epidemic occurs when the number of cases of a particular disease in a population exceeds what is normally expected for that population in a given time and place. And in other words, an epidemic is a sudden increase in the number of cases of a disease in a particular population. And the disease may be limited to a specific geographic area or affect multiple regions. And examples of epidemics include the outbreak of the Ebola virus disease in West Africa in 2014-2016 and the flu season in the United States each year. And pandemic, a pandemic is a global epidemic. It occurs when a new virus or strain of virus emerges and spreads worldwide, new pathogen basically, not only virus, affecting a large number of people across multiple countries or continents. Examples of pandemics obviously include the COVID-19 pandemic that began in 2019 and the 1918 influenza pandemic which killed an estimated 50 million people worldwide. So outbreak is something on a very lower term. Outbreak is a sudden occurrence of cases of a particular disease in a specific geographic area or population. An outbreak may be small, localized event or a larger event that affects multiple communities. Examples of outbreaks can be, you know, include foodborne uh, foodborne illness outbreaks traced to a specific restaurant 
or a cluster case of measles cluster of cases of measles among unvaccinated individuals in a particular school or community so these are the so this is how uh, the who or the world health organization uh, talks about the pandemic phase descriptions and main actions uh, by phase so this is all you can actually find out in uh, the who website as well so we'll move on to the next question which of the following is a symptom of cholera high fever and night sweats abdominal pain severe diarrhea and dehydration coughing and weakness muscles muscle aches and sore throat so which one do you think is a which ones do you think are the symptoms of cholera yes option b yeah. so yes you're right abdominal pain uh, severe diarrhea and dehydration so cholera is basically a bacterial infection that affects the small intestine and it is caused by the bacterium vibrio cholerae and is typically spread through contaminated water or food it's most common in areas with very poor sanitation poor hygiene particularly in parts of africa asia and haiti and uh, cholera spreads when a person ingests food or water uh, contaminated with the bacterium vibrio cholerae and the bacterium then produces a toxin that causes the small intestine to release large amounts of water leading to severe diarrhea and dehydration so when your body is letting out water that will lead to dehydration right so the disease can spread rapidly in areas with poor sanitation particularly during times of overcrowding or when there's a lack of clean drinking water and symptoms of cholera typically appear within 2 to 5 days of exposure and can range from mild to severe the most common symptoms include the diarrhea which can be very severe and watery nausea and vomiting abdominal cramps dehydration which can lead to fatigue uh, sunken eyes dry mouth and throat and rapid heartbeat because there is a the need of water in your body and in severe cases cholera can actually lead to shock and even death within hours if left untreated however with proper treatment including oral rehydration therapy and antibiotics most people with cholera recover within a few days and in addition to proper medical treatment preventing the spread of cholera it requires improvements in sanitation access to clean water and hygiene practices which is still not available in many parts of the of our country as well in many rural areas uh, it's still not available so the first known cholera pandemic occurred in the early 19th century between i think 1817 to 1824 uh, in the ganges delta region of india and the disease then spread to southeast asia the middle east africa europe causing widespread illness and death and this pandemic actually marked the beginning of a series of cholera pandemics that continued to occur over the next century so at that point of time there was obviously much much uh, uh, like poor uh, sanitation at that point of time no medical uh, advancements like compared to today there was not at that much medical advancement people did not have uh that much uh, to afford to treat themselves so cholera is thought to have existed in the indian subcontinent for centuries before the 19th century pandemic as well however the disease was not fully understood at the time and the first recorded outbreak was in the uh, bengal region of india in 1817 the disease then spread rapidly along trade routes and shipping lanes and by the early 1830s it had reached north america and europe and the spread of cholera during the 19th century had a significant impact on global health and led to the development of public health measures such as improved sanitation hygiene practices and water treatment methods the development of antibiotics and introduction of the oral rehydration therapy i think started in the 20th century these have also helped to reduce the mortality rate of cholera outbreaks however cholera still remains a very significant public health threat particularly in areas with poor sanitation and limited access to uh, clean water so these uh, what are what the signs of uh, cholera so moving on uh, so the symptoms of cholera vomiting low blood pressure diarrhea rapid weight loss and increased uh, thirst uh, and all these loss of skin elasticity all of these will so prevention of cholera can only happen when we have a lot of uh, hygiene incorporated into the daily lifestyle so wash your hand with soap and water drink and you see for the clean up safely so all of these uh, are easily available to us but we are still 
luxuries for some people living in rural India and that's why cholera cases are still high in some parts of rural India. So how can the water distribution system contribute to the spread of cholera? To provide a conduit for contaminated water to reach households and communities, add chemicals to the water that promote the growth of Vibrio cholerae by creating stagnant water reservoirs that destroy Vibrio cholerae by reducing the flow of water to a level that encourages the development of Vibrio cholerae. Which one do you think is the correct answer? Sorry? Anybody else? Yeah, so it's obviously option A. Uh, the water distribution system can actually contribute to the spread of cholera in several ways. Because cholera is a waterborne disease that is transmitted through contaminated water or food. And basically, uh, the water distribution system can become contaminated if the water sources used to supply water to communities are contaminated with the cholera back, uh, vibrio cholera. And this can happen if sewage or uh, other contaminated water sources are mixed with the clean water supply. Then poor sanitation practices. If the water distribution system is not properly maintained or if the sanitation practices are poor, then the pipes and the reservoirs that store and transport water can become contaminated with cholera bacteria. And this can happen if water treatment facilities are not functioning properly or if the water supplies are properly disinfected at regular time in intervals of time. Then there is lack of lack of access to clean water. So in some areas the water distribution system may not be able to provide clean water to all the residents. And this can lead to a situation where people are forced to use contaminated water sources such as rivers and ponds which can be a source of cholera bacteria. Then in inadequate hygiene practices, even if the water distribution system is functioning properly, Cholera can still spread if people do not practice good hygiene, such as washing their hands before eating or drinking, and this can lead to the spread of cholera bacteria from contaminated water sources to food or directly to other people. Overall, ensuring that the water distribution system is properly maintained, providing access to clean water, promoting good hygiene practices, and ensuring that water treatment facilities are functioning properly are all essential to preventing the spread of cholera. And uh, as I said, cholera was actually first described in the areas of uh, around the Bay of Bengal uh, and the spread globally resulting in seven pandemics during the past centuries and it is caused by the tox toxicogenic Vibrio cholerae O1 or O139 bacteria. So it can, it's characterized by mild to potentially fatal acute watery diarrheal disease and prompt rehydration therapy is the cornerstone of management. So, since 2014, the Global Task Force on Cholera Control uh, uh, who, uh, Initiative and Coordinated uh, Network of Partners has been working with several countries to develop national cholera control strategies. And the Global Roadmap for Cholera Control um, focuses on stopping transmission in cholera hotspots through vaccination and improved water, sanitation and hygiene and with the aim to reduce cholera deaths by 90% and eliminate local transmission in at least 20, century, uh, 20 countries. And like cholera has plagued humans uh, for years and this is basically how the colonization of the small intestine happens and how the entire process happens. What else happens in the body that actually leads to diarrhea? So water is actually uh, given out and that's why what makes your body severely deficient to water. So this is basically the pathophysiology and virulence factors, the virulence factors. So it typically enters the host, typically enters the host through contaminated food or beverage and if the bacteria survive the low pH of the stomach, we know that the stomach has a very low pH, uh, acidic pH. If it survives the low pH of the stomach, they enter the small intestine where they move towards the epithelial cells by chemotaxis, you can see over here, and then multiply and secrete cholera toxin. Cholera toxin has an enzymatically active A subunit which activates adenylate cyclase, which adenylate cyclase to release, uh, to cause a net increase in cyclic uh, AMP you can see from here the cyclic AMP is uh, 
increase and the increased cyclic AAP leads to the activation of protein kinase A which inhibits sodium chloride absorption resulting in an efflux of chloride ions and secretion of hydrogen carbonate ions sodium and potassium ions in water. So loss of chloride prompts substantial fluid secretion into the small intestine overwhelming the resorptive capacity of the large intestine resulting in the severe watery diarrhea. An expression of toxin, co-regulated pilus, cholera toxin and other virulence factors are under the control of the virulence regulon. Tox are. So Vibrio quality adjusts its life cycle using other factors such as flagella synthesis and expression of genes by RNA polymerase. And Vibrio quality also uses quorum sensing to detect signal molecules called autoinducers which help the pathogen to synchronize uh, biofilm formation expression of virulence and production of secondary metabolites, allowing the pathogen to infect the small intestine and to survive in the presence of bile, salts and reduce oxygen. So several studies are there that have highlighted the role of gut microbiome in shaping Vibrio cholerae infection, uh, cholerization and disease severity risk. And the presence of some microbial communities such as genera, uh, Revotella and Bifidobacterium have been associated with the protection from cholera and also inhibit the virulence gene expression of Vibrio cholerae. So infection with uh, Vibrio cholerae can result in spectrum of disease presentations from symptomless intestinal colonization to mild or severe diarrhea and the likelihood that exposure to Vibrio cholerae results in disease depends on the route of exposure, the inoculum size, the infecting strain, previous infection history and other host and pathogen attributes. Uh, so and freshly shed Vibrio cholerae exists in a transient hyperinfectious state where the infectious dose might be even further reduced. And in cholera endemic areas, previous cholera infection leads to a lower likelihood of severe diseases during exposure. For example, in Bangladesh, an estimated 2% of people infected with Vibrio cholerae developed uh, severe cholera. Uh, by, but by contrast, I think in rural Haiti 2011, some less than a year after cholera was first introduced into the country, 9% of those with serological evidence of recent infection reported severe cholera-like symptoms. And the incubation period of cholera is usually between half a day and 4 to 5 days, after which illness uh, typically starts suddenly with a frequent <coughs> stool passage and often vomiting. And although fluid loss varies widely across medically estimated uh, medically attended patients, <coughs> a kind of analysis has shown that a median stool volume of 13.5 uh, liter over the duration of hospitalization in case of adults. So uh, that's what happens during cholera. So moving on to the next question. <coughs> <coughs> so there are two statements mentioned. Which one do you think is correct among, among the four options? The statement A says that high sensitivity is a preferred characteristic of a biosensor as it allows for detecting low concentrations of the target substance or organism in a sample. And statement B says that biosensors are designed to be highly specific to detect the target substance or organism in the presence of other substances or organisms in the sample. Which statement is true? Anybody else? You have anybody else having a different opinion or do you agree? So yes, A and B are both uh, true statements. So biosensors are uh, nowadays ubiquitous in medical di biomedical diagnosis as well as a wide range of other areas such as uh, point of care, uh, food point of care, uh, monitoring of treatment and disease progression, and Sorry, environmental monitoring, food control, drug discovery, forensics, and biomedical research. And a wide range of techniques can be used for the development of biosensors. Their coupling with high affinity biomolecules allows the sensitive and selective detection of the range of analytes. So, uh, you actually find a lot of papers on the internet where they give introduction to biosensors and actually talk about the biosensing technologies, including. Uh, uh, introducing key developments in the field and illustrating the breadth of biomolecular sensing 
strategies and the expansion of uh, nanotechnological approaches that are now available. So, biosensor is basically a device that measures biological or chemical reactions by generating signals proportional to the concentration of an analyte in the reaction. And biosensors are employed in applications such as disease monitoring, drug discovery, and the detection of pollutants, disease causing microorganisms, and markers that are indicators of a disease in bodily fluids, such as blood, urine, saliva, sweat. And this is a typical uh, biosensor uh, schematic. It consists of these of the these following components: analyte. Analyte is a substance of interest that needs detection. For example, glucose is an analyte in a biosensor designed to detect glucose. Then we have the bioreceptor, a molecule that is specifically a molecule that specifically recognizes the analyte is known as the bioreceptor. So enzymes, cells, aptamers, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid DNA, and antibodies, nanoparticles are some examples of bioreceptors. The process of signal generation in the form of light, heat pH, charge or mass change upon interaction of the bioreceptor <coughs> and the analyte is termed as biorecognition. And then we can <coughs> then we have a transducer. So transducer basically is an element that converts one form of energy into another. <coughs> Give me a minute. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, yeah, so next we have transducer. The transducer is basically an element that converts one form of uh, energy to another. So, in a biosensor, the role of transducer is to convert the biorecognition event into a measurable signal. And this process of energy conversion is known as signalization. And most transducers uh, produce either optical or electrical signals that are usually proportional to the amount of analyte bioreceptor interactions. Then we, the other next component will be electronics. So this is a part of the biosensor that processes the transduced signal and prepares it for display. So it consists of a complex electronic circuitry that performs signal conditioning such as amplification and conversion of signals from analog into the digital form and the process signals are then quantified by the display unit of the biosensor. Next is the display unit. So the display consists of a user interpretation system such as the liquid crystal display LCD of a computer or a direct printer that generates numbers or curves understandable by the user. Now this part often uh, consists of a combination of hardware and software that generates results of the biosensor <coughs> in a user-friendly manner and the output signal on the display can be numeric, graphic, tabular or just an image depending on the requirements of the end user. So the characteristics of a biosensor are one and many. So there are certain static and dynamic attributes that every biosensor uh, possesses. The optimization of these properties is reflected on the performance of the biosensor, such as selectivity. So selectivity is perhaps the most important feature of a biosensor because it is basically the ability of a bioreceptor to detect a specific analyte in a sample containing other admixtures and contaminants. So the best example of selectivity is depicted by the interaction of an antigen with the antibody. 
Classically, antibodies act as uh, bioreceptors and are immobilized on the surface of the transducer. And a solution, usually a buffer containing salts, containing the antigen is then exposed to the transducer where antibodies interact only with the an antigens. To construct a biosensor, selectivity is the main consideration when choosing bioreceptors. The other criteria is can be reproducibility. So reproducibility is the ability of the biosensor to generate identical responses from a duplicated experimental setup. So the reproducibility is very important in scientific world. It's characterized by the precision and accuracy of the transducer and the electronics in a biosensor. And precision is the ability of the sensor to provide alike results every time a sample is measured and accuracy indicates the sensor's capacity to provide a mean value close to the true value when a sample is measured more than once. So reproducible signals provide high reliability and robustness to the inter inference made on the response of a biosensor. Then comes stability. Stability is the degree of susceptibility to ambient disturbances in and around the biosensor system. So these disturbances can cause a drift in the output signals of a biosensor under measurement. This can cause an error in the measured concentration and can affect the precision and accuracy of the biosensor. So stability is the most crucial fact feature in applications where a biosensor requires long incubation steps or continuous monitoring. And the response of transducers and electronics can be temperature sensitive, which may influence the stability of a biosensor. Therefore, appropriate tuning of electronics is required to ensure a stable response of the sensor. Another factor that can influence the stability is the affinity of the bioreceptor. So, which can, which is the degree basically, degree uh, to which the analyte binds to the bioreceptor. So, bioreceptors with high affinities encourage either strong electrostatic bonding or covalent linkage of the analyte that fortifies the stability of the biosensor. And another factor that affects the stability of a measurement is the degradation of the bioreceptor over a period of time. Another criteria of a biosensor should be sens sensitivity, as is mentioned here. The minimum amount of analyte that can be detected by a biosensor defines its limit of detection or LOD or sensitivity. In a number of medical and environmental monitoring applications, a biosensor is actually required to you know, detect an analytical concentration of as low as nanogram per ml a milliliter, or even a femtogram per ml to confirm the presence of traces of analytes in a sample. For instance, a prostrate specific antigen concentration of 4 nanogram per ml in blood is associated with prostate cancer for which doctors suggest biopsy tests. Hence, sensitivity is considered to be a very, a very important property of biosensor. So, the first statement is true. Another important property of biosensor should be linearity. Linearity is the attribute that shows the accuracy of the measured response for a set of measurements uh, with different concentration of the analyte to a straight line, basically mathematically what we represent as y equal to mc where C is the concentration of the analyte, Y is the output signal, and M is the sensitivity of the biosensor. So, linearity of the biosensor can be associated with the resolution of the biosensor and the range of analyte concentrations under test. And the resolution of the biosensor is defined as the smallest change in the concentration of an analyte that is required to bring a change in the response of the biosensor. So, depending on the application, a good resolution is required as most biosensor applications require not only analyte detection, but also measurement of concentrations of analyte over a wide working range. Another term associated with linearity is linear range. It is defined as the range of analyte concentrations for which the biosensor response changes linearly with concentration. So these are some of the uh, characteristics that is uh, required in a biosensor. And talk about application. So biosensors have a wide range of applications that aim to improve the quality of life every day. So this range covers their use for environmental monitoring, disease detection, food safety, defense, drug discovery and so many more. And one of the main applications of biosensors is the detection of biomolecules that are either indicators of a disease or targets of a drug. For example, electrochemical biosensing techniques can be used as clinical tools to detect uh, protein cancer biomarkers. And biosensors can then be used uh, as platforms for monitoring food traceability, quality, safety, and nutritional value. And these applications fall into a category of single-shot analysis tools, where cost-effective and 
disposable sensing platforms are required for the application. On the other hand, an application such as pollution monitoring requires a biosensor to function from a few hours to several days. And such biosensors can be termed long-term monitoring analysis tools. Whether it's long-term monitoring or single-shot analysis, biosensors find their use as a technologically advanced device, both in resource-limited settings and sophisticated medical setups with applications in drug discovery. For the detection of uh, agents, um, a number of chemical and biological agents that are considered to be toxic materials of defense interest for use in artificial and implantable de devices such as even pacemakers and other prosthetic devices also and sewage epidemiology and a range of electrochemical, uh, optical and ac acoustic sensing technology techniques have also been utilized along with the integration into the analytical devices um, for various applications. So this can act actually indicate the different uh, areas of research where biosensors have been used. So yes, this the first statement is true because high sensitivity is definitely a very critical characteristic for a biosensor as it enables the detection of uh, low concentrations of the target um, substance or organism in a sample. And a biosensor uh, is a device that integrates biological sensing element with the transducer to produce an electronic signal proportional to the concentration of the target and light. So the sensitivity of the biosensor determines the lowest concentration uh, of the analyte that can be detected. Therefore, a biosensor with high sensitivity can detect even very low concentration of the target substance or organism, making it more useful and applicable in various fields such as medicine, environmental monitoring, and food safety. And the second statement is also very true because biosensors have to be designed to be very highly specific to detect a particular substance or organism of interest in the presence of other contaminants of other substances or organisms and they work by basically recognizing and binding to a specific molecule or a biomolecule which triggers a measurable signal that indicates the presence of the target uh, substance or organism and this specificity is essential for the accuracy and the reliability of biosensors in various applications so that's medical diagnosis, environmental monitoring, and food safety testing. So yeah, testing. So any moving on to the next question, what is the role of the transducer in a biosensor? Which one do you think is true? Yes. So the transducer is basically an element that converts one form of energy to another and in a biosensor the role of the transducer is to convert the biorecognition event that is happening here this biorecognition event to a measurable signal and this process of energy conversion is known as signalization as I already said before most transducers produce either optical or electrical signals that are usually proportional to the amount of analyte bioreceptor interactions so this is basically a schematic illustration of biosensing. So analyte containing bodily uh, fluids match with the bioreceptor, uh, which can be an enzyme, antibody, uh, cell, aptamer, uh, nucleic acid or biomimetic based. And the matching of the analyte and the bioreceptor creates a change in the signal that is registered and converted to a measurable output by the transducer. Now, signal conversion can be in the means of electrochemical, optical, thermal, or gravimetric, and the output signal is processed by the integrated or the district, uh, discrete electronics where the signal can be amplified, filtered, or sent to desired device platforms. And for extended functionality, functionality and mobility, uh, modern biosensors provide wireless uh, data communication to smart devices with their integrated data communication module. This way, the extracted signal can be displayed or recorded on any mobile device for personal health monitoring. So, as you can see from here, so biosensors in today's time can monitor target analytes such as biomarkers, pathogens, and allergens, and all can be exploited as an indicator of the health status, not only to diagnose, but also to monitor the patient's prognosis. And this track record is favored, especially for elderly individuals and individuals with alcohol or drug abuse histories. Because monitoring the levels of exogenous substances is also leveraged for the healthcare professionals to provide a full-fledged guidance. So the analytes within the biological components of a biosensor can be extracted from different bodily fluids such as sweat, saliva, tears, urine and blood. 
in addition to the viral secretion from bodily fluids, the variety and the extended functionality of the transducing mechanisms allow for the extraction of vital signs such as basal body temperature, uh, heart and respiratory rates, systolic and diastolic uh, pressures, and even tremors. So, when combined with the readout electronics, the output signal from the transducers can be traced, analyzed, and recorded to evaluate the health required health related quality of uh, life and in today's world the maintenance of health related quality of life is raising the concern in society which increases the demand for variable biosensors monitoring vital processes to that end variables have brought a completely different perspective to modern medicine from fitness trackers to medical devices in the clinical setting and the technologies that offer mobility to patients and clinicians authenticated the contribution of variable biosensors in remote detection and the monitoring of the individual's health status. So perceiving the signs of these potential uh, clinical issues in the maneuverability of the healthcare professionals not only to monitor their self-quarantine patients but also to increase their preparedness by tracking their philo- physiological status as frontline workers. And uh, you know, determining and recording the physiological parameters and comparing them to critical thresholds with uh, like perfect, like absolute precision, it has gradually become easier over the years with the foreseeable progress of uh, biotechnology. So the biological systems have radically progressed from the times when samples were taken uh, from the relevant person and delivered to different laboratories to the point of care, diagnostics, a bedside patient follow-up unit which is directly accessible to the person concerned. And in line with this progress, the continuous tracking of body output is not now provided by variable biosensors like, like a smartwatch. And the breakthrough advantages of these uh, variable technology compared to the conventional bioanalytical methods or point of care testing devices are that their continuous monitoring does not require an invasive way to collect samples from the person of interest and can be performed at a very uh, user friendly and uh, operation in a low cost. And so that's why there is an academic and industrial interest also in variable, techno- variable technologies which greatly uh, attracted the development of new mobile devices, advancing the uh, advancing biosensors by combining them with new materials and uh, compact electronics. So if you go on and search on PubMed for the articles published with the keywords, you know, variable and biosensor in their abstracts, you can actually reduce that nearly half of those address the significance of the predictive and the personalized remote advantages. So likewise, wearable, uh, sorry, likewise, wearable biosensors specific to the diagnosis and prognosis of even COVID-19 have strengthened their use in the market for healthy individuals as well as for patients during the pandemic. So that is how uh, these things have evolved. And biosensors have also evolved as a combination of bioreceptors and transducers based on the electrochemical, optical, thermal, and gravimetric methods, converting the signals from analytes containing antibodies, nucleic acids, immunological agents, microorganisms, hormones, enzymes, cells, tissues, chemical receptors, and other detectable uh, bodily biological inputs. For most biosensors, the device construction entails these these uh, three steps, uh, implementation of a bioreceptor that reacts with the specific analyte, integration of a transducer, uh, and fixation and the immobilization of a biological component to the transducer. <coughs> and therefore, creating a biosensing device strongly depends on these construction steps together with the device design strategies and the integration of the readout electronics for variable devices that will provide continuous use on the human body. And it is also important um, that to acknowledge that the isolation from external factors such as chemical, physical conditions, temperature, contaminants, pH should be further taken into consideration while constructing variable biosensors uh, for specific applications. So now people are uh, wearing uh, their variable Biosensors worn on the head, neck, torso, legs, feet, arm, hands, and fingers. And there are multiple areas where people are wearing uh, wearable biosensors. So that is the uh, that is to this day the advancement of biosensors in today's time. So moving on to the next question, which of the following is an example of a biosensor? Pregnancy test, nitrate biosensor, glucose monitors, rapid antigen test for COVID-19. Or all of the, all of the above. Which one do you think is the correct answer?
anybody? Anybody else? Having any other opinion? Okay. See, yes, all of these are uh, examples of biosensors. So, this is what happens in a pregnancy test. Uh, a biosensor is a basically a device which uses biological components such as uh, enzymes, antibodies, or nucleic acids to detect the presence of uh, a particular of concentration of a particular molecule in a sample. So, in the case of the pregnancy test, the biological component is basically an antibody that recognizes the presence of human chorionic gonadotropin HCG, a hormone that is produced by the placenta after a fertilized egg implants in the uterus. So, the pregnancy test works by detecting the presence of this particular hormone in a woman's urine sample. And the urine sample is applied to the test strip which contains the antibody specific to HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin. And if this particular hormone is present in the urine, it will bind to the antibody and the test strip will uh, indicate a positive result, typically with the appearance of a colored line. Therefore, a pregnancy test is an example of a biosensor that uses an antibody to detect the presence of a specific molecule and in this case this uh, molecule is HCG. It is very specifically prepared in a, like made in a huge amount in a pregnant woman and this indicates pregnancy. A nitrate biosensor is also a biosensor but in the case of a nitrate biosensor the biological component would be an enzyme that specifically interacts uh, with nitrate and the transducer would then convert the resulting biochemical signal into a measurable electrical or optical signal. And nitrate biosensors are often used in environmental monitoring applications to detect nitrate levels in water, water or soil as well as in agriculture to optimize the fertilizer usage. A glucose monitor is also a type of uh, biosensor. So, in this case, the enzyme, which is uh, basically it uses a biological component such as an enzyme to detect and measure the concentration of glucose in a sample such as blood. So, the enzyme typically, which is glucose oxidase, catalyzes the oxidation of glucose to produce hydrogen peroxide, which is detected by the transducer such as an electrode. The amount of hydrogen peroxide produced is proportional to the glucose concentration in the sample. Okay. You can see the hydrogen peroxide. So, this the amount of hydrogen peroxide that is produced is proportional to the glucose concentration in the sample allowing for the measurement of glucose levels in real time and glucose monitors are commonly used by people with diabetes to monitor the uh, their blood glucose levels and adjust their insulin doses automatically accordingly not automatically and uh, a rapid antigen test for COVID-19 is also a type of biosensor. Uh, I don't know if you have used it. I have used it myself. It is, is a biological component uh, like just antibodies to detect the presence of viral antigen in a sample sample such as a nasal swab. So the test strips uh, specifically typically contains antibodies that are specific to the SARS-CoV-2 virus which binds to viral proteins if present in the sample and this binding event then triggers a signal such as a color change which can be detected by the user or a portable reader device and rapid antigen tests for COVID-19 are very commonly used as a quick and convenient method for detecting the virus in individuals with symptoms uh, or suspected exposure. So yes, all of these uh, are uh, examples of biosensors and this uh, pregnancy test is a label based biosensor because uh, it there is a particular Im implementation of a so-called lateral flow assay uh, and it's a masterpiece of science and accuracy arguably unparalleled, unparalleled by any other biosensor. Its success is mainly based on that it reports only a yes no answer and it's pregnant versus non-pregnant and no exact quantification is required. So this assay lateral flow assay or the pregnancy test or any lateral flow assay composed of serious each of which with its own function. So when a pregnant woman's urine is applied to the test, it first travels to the reaction zone via capillary forces and a hormone produced by a pregnant woman is called human chorionic uh, gonadotropin will bind to the antibody specific to the hormone. And the antibodies have an enzyme which is horse radish peroxidase attached to them. So once the HCG or the uh, 
human chorionic gonadotropin binds to the antibodies in the reaction zone. The urine sample with the HCG antibody complex continues to travel along the test strip to the test strip to the test zone. And there the uh, HCG or the human chorionic gonadotropin antibody complex binds to another antibody also specific for HCG. And this antibody has a coloring agent attached to it. Typically it's a gold nanoparticle uh, color because colloidal gold is typically reddish in color. At this stage, after both antibodies have found uh, have bound HCG, the host reddish peroxidin, uh, peroxidase enzyme from the first antibody activates the coloring agent, amplif amplifying the signal enzymatically and causing a color change, which is the first line that appears on the pregnancy test. The last zone which the sample flows through is the control zone. It's the control zone you can see, and there any free unbound antibodies are bound by a third antibody with the dye molecule. So when binding occurs, the second strip appears, thus confirming the positive result and that the test wasn't faulty. So this is how, you know, and you know, uh, gold nanoparticles used as a coloring agent in the pregnancy test are not a modern invention. In fact, gold nanoparticles were used already during medieval times as well to color glass windows in churches and trapped gold nanoparticles in a glass matrix can create a ruby color. So that is uh, the precision of this uh, biosensor and glucose meter is also as the name suggests it's a glucose monitor aimed at monitoring blood glucose levels uh, or more specifically measuring the amount of glucose in a person's blood at a given time point the glucose meter senses glucose by utilizing this enzyme that naturally reacts to it uh, glucose oxidase so when a drop of blood is administered on a glucose strip, the glucose in that blood sample reacts with the glucose oxidase enzymes like that is uh, contained in that strip. The strip itself is pushed into the insertion in the glucose meter where it is in contact with an interface with an electrode. As the biochemical reaction between the glucose and the glucose oxidase occurs, an electric current is generated by the electrons formed in the, in the reaction. It is sensed by the electrode. The glucose meter then shows a number on its display which corresponds to the strength of the electric current sensed by the electrode. And the glucose monitor which is the glucometer was actually the first biosensor ever invented. Its technology is attributed to Leland Clark who began working on the oxygen electrode in 1956 and Anton H. Clemens, Clemens who later developed the device basically. So moving on to the next question, uh, DASH is an example of an optical biosensor and it uses a label free technique that detects changes in refractive index on the surface of a thin metal film. On the other hand, DASH is an example of a potentiometric biosensor that measures the potential difference across a membrane which is sensitive to specific ions. Which of the four options do you think uh, should be correct? Anybody? So yes, the first option is correct. It's the uh, surface surface plasma resonance or what we call the SPR technique. So SPR biosensors belong to the label-free optical biosensing technologies. The SPR method is based on optical measurement of refractive index changes associated with the binding of analyte molecules in a sample to biorecognize molecules immobilized on the SPR sensor. And since I think late 1990s, SPR biosensors have become the main tool for the study of biomolecular interactions, both in life science and pharmaceutical research. And in addition, they have been increasingly applied in the detection of chemical and biological substances in important areas such as medical uh, diagnostics, environmental toxicology, environmental monitoring, food safety and security. And uh, there are basic principles of the SPR biosensor technology. Uh, so this is optical affinity biosensors based on SPR, uh, present one of the most advanced level free optical sensing technologies and the ability to monitor the interaction between a molecule immobilized on the surface of the sensor 
and uh, in the interacting molecule pattern in a solution have made SPSS as is a very powerful tool for biomedical interaction analysis and biomedical research in general and in recent years SPR biosensors have been increasingly used also for the detection of chemical and biological substances related to the medical diagnostics environmental monitoring and food safety security so yes uh, the option the first option is a connect uh, surface plant is uh, surface plasma resonance is a uh, is an optical biosensor technique that uses level free technique to detect changes in the refractive index on the surface of a thin metal film and they work by measuring the changes in the angle of light that is reflected off the metal uh, film and back into the detector. So when a biological sample is introduced onto the surface of the metal film, interactions between the sample and the metal film cause changes in the refractive index that alter the angle of the reflected light. And by monitoring these changes in real time, SPR can actually provide information about the kinetics and the affinity of the molecular interactions without the need for labeling or modifying the biological molecules <coughs> of interest. And SPR biosensors are widely used in drug discovery, molecular biology, and biomedical research for applications such as protein protein interactions, antibody antigen binding, and DNA hybridization. So, yes. The next was ion selective electron. So, ion selective electrodes are uh, electroanalytical sensors whose signals depend on the activities of ions in solution and exhibit a certain degree of selectivity for particular ionic species. So, the operation of classical ion selective electrodes is based on direct measurement of a single membrane potential at zero net charge. And at present, uh, ion selective electrodes uh, also include electrodes containing two or more membranes or highly selective biochemical systems and semiconductor systems sensors. So the range of chemical species sensed is thus greatly broadened, involving various non-ionic compounds and some gases. The selectivity is also improved. The history of these electrodes is quite long, almost one century. It involves three distinct stages, like 50 years of gradual development of the glass pH electrode, the period of rapid development of various types of ion selective electrodes starting in the late 1950s and ending in the beginning of the 1980s and the present period during which the field of ionic selective electrodes is being preferred uh, is being perfected you know technically with emphasis on miniaturization and the range of highly specialized and selective electrodes is being extended primarily those selective for uh, biologically medically and environmentally important in analytes so the theoretical background has been developed gradually and its present state was completed in the 1970s itself and at present efforts are actually primarily detected uh, directed towards the scattering of uh, suppose the gathering uh, of highly scattered information and unification and standardization of the environmental approaches and routine analytical procedures uh, as you can see and the oldest and the still the most widely used uh, ion selective electrode will be the glass pH electrode invented I think in the 1900s by Kremer and in the 1909 by Haber and Clement Schmitz. So it became a standard lab tool during the 1930s and early attempts at constructing glass electrodes sensitive to ions other than hydroxylium ions and electrodes uh, with, mem or mem with membranes or materials other than glass were unsuccessful. I think only in the late 1950s uh, did practically useful glass electrodes appear that were sensitive to the alkali, alkali, alkali metal, ammonium and silver ions. However, they are no longer uh, used. So, if a substance that is not sensed by any ion selective electrode undergoes a selective uh, biochemical reaction producing or consuming suitable ions then it can be determined indirectly by monitoring these ions with an ion selective electrode and the selective biochemical uh, system is usually directly attached to the ion selective electrode membrane and in this way sensors have actually been obtained for acidic, acidic gases and a great variety of enzymatic and immunological uh, sensors for many important organic compounds have been developed on this principle. The membrane potentials can also be measured indirectly if the membrane is fixed on the surface of a field effect uh, transistor uh, from which the metallic gate has been removed and the electric current passing uh, between the source and the 
drain of the field effect transistor is then controlled by the membrane potential. So, yes, an ion selective electrode uh, is a potentiometric biosensor uh, that measures you know, the potential difference across a membrane that is sensitive to specific ions. And the electrode is designed to respond selectively to a particular ion or a group of ions and generates a voltage signal proportional uh, to the ion concentration in the sample. And the potential difference across the membrane is measured using a reference electrode and the resulting voltage signal is converted into an ion concentration value using a calibration curve. And ion selective electrodes are commonly used in the measurement of ions such as pH, sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride in various uh, biological, environmental and industrial ap applications uh, basically. So yes, your answer is correct. It should be option E. Moving on to the next question. What is the advantage of using uh, AUNP, which is basically gold nanoparticles, in a biosensor? It can detect heavy metals in water and wastewater. It can measure the concentration of the nutrient in the soil. It is a type of electrochemical biosensor. It uses gold nanoparticles to amplify the Raman signal. So which one do you think is correct? Anybody? Yeah. So anybody else who has a different opinion? So AUNP slash gold nanoparticles in general have various uh, advantages. High sensitivity, like they have a large surface area to volume ratio, which allows for a high density of immobilized biomolecules on their surface. And this can enhance sensitivity of biosensors, allowing for the detection of very small amounts of analytes. Then comes biocompatibility. So, gold nanoparticles are biocompatible and non-toxic, making them suitable for use in biosensors for biological applications. Then comes uh, stability. Uh, gold nanoparticles are stable and do not easily aggregate or degrade, ensuring the long-term stability uh, and reliability of biosensors. Then obviously the optical properties. Gold nanoparticles exhibit unique optical properties such as surface plasma resonance which can be exploited for label free detection of biomolecules in biosensors and also the ease of functionalization. So gold nanoparticles can be easily functionalized with a wide range of biomolecules such as proteins, enzymes, DNA and antibodies enabling the development of highly specific biosensors for a wide range of applications. So overall the use of gold nanoparticles uh, in biosensors offers several advantages including high sensitivity, biocompatibility, stability, unique optical properties and ease of functionalization, making them a promising platform for the development of biosensors for various biological applications. Electrochemical biosensors also show the advantages of high sensitivity, low cost, amenable miniaturization and operating convenience. However, uh, gold nanoparticles play an important role in improving the sensitivity and the specificity of the electrochemical biosensors such as modifying the sensing surface to enhance conductivity, increasing the immobilization of biomolecules and catalyzing the electrochemical reactions. In addition, these uh, gold nanoparticles are also used as electrochemical indicators. Also, yes, uh, the Raman signal can be amplifi amplified by using gold nanoparticles um, as a substrate. So this technique is known as surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy or SERS. Yeah. So when molecules are adsorbed, uh, adsorbed uh, onto the surface of gold nanoparticles, they can generate a strong electromagnetic field that enhances the Raman signal of the molecules. And this effect is due to the localized surface plasmon resonance of the gold nanoparticles, which enhances the electromagnetic field near the surface of the particles. So, a surface enhanced uh, Raman spectroscopy is a very powerful technique for detecting, you know, trace uh, amounts of analytes and it has applications in fields such as biochemistry, material science and environmental uh, monitoring. So, yeah, that is the point of, that is the advantage of uh, using whole nanoparticles in a biosensor. Also, it amplifies the Raman signal. So yes, you can see, it also actually has a lot of uh, advantages apart from the Raman signal also, it's also very power compatible and you can actually do uh, colorimetry detection as well. 
So moving on to the next question. The transducer of a biosensor produces electrical signals as they can be read on the computer. Is it true or not? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah, so we have already discussed. Yeah, so it's true. We've already discussed about the transducer. So basically they can uh, no, in some cases, they can actually uh, also produce electrical signals. I don't know why. Uh, they actually change. Uh, wait one second. I'll go back to this later. So, yes, they actually convert the biological signal to an electrical signal. So, I'm sorry, this might be. Achha, so I think it will be false because the word produces is uh, included. They convert uh, by recognition to electrical signals. But uh, actually, okay, the, when I did it, I thought I, produces might not be the uh, correct term to use in a question like this. Uh, but the role of the transducer is basically to convert the bad recognition, whatever is happening between the analyte and whatever DNA uh, or aptamer or antibody are attaching to the transducer whatever the uh, the uh, interaction is happening and to what proportion the interaction is happening it will then basically change it into electrical signals it does not produce electrical signals as such but it definitely converts the other signals to electrical signals so in that aspect uh, this transducer producing electrical signals will not be the correct term exactly but definitely it uh, helps in the changing conversion of one like the whatever interaction is happening over here with an analytes to in this signal so that's why maybe uh, when i did it produces should not be the right answer converts should have been uh, used in this statement then that would have been true otherwise uh, it does not produce any kind of electrical signals on its own it basically converts whatever uh, signal is generated whatever kind of interaction is happening between the analyte and the uh, analyte and the recognition element that only it converts to the yeah bioreceptor right bioreceptor is the right word i was not remembering it whatever kind of interaction is happening between the analyte and the bioreceptor it basically converts it to an electrical signal which is further uh, read by the computer and shown as display it does not and this is called bad recognition so it does not uh, produce electrical signals on its own so in that way that statement is false but definitely it has a role in generating electrical signals because it's converting the signals from uh, the interaction to the computer basically showing it up in the computer so we go to the next question gold nanoparticles are used in bar sensor as this so I, we have already discussed about this so gold nanoparticles have a lot of advantages okay, so which do you think is the correct option enhance yeah. the signal yeah yeah enhance the signal because it also amplifies the raman signal as we talked in uh, surface enhanced raman uh, spectroscopy SERS technique and apart from that also, uh, there are a lot of factors why it's used in biosensor. None of these options, uh, apart from enhance the signal, but also apart from enhancing the signal, they have very unique properties they very, because they are very uh, compatible. They are excellent, uh, they, are, they show excellent conductivity, they are effective catalysis, there is high density and high surface to volume ratio. So gold nanoparticles are like, a gold standard basically used in the field of bioassay and they can be used in optical biosensors and it has been distributed described in many published papers online you can go and check where they highlight recent advances in gold nanoparticle based non-optical biosensors as well including piezoelectric biosensor and uh, electrochemical biosensor and in inductively coupled uh, plasma mass spectrometry icpms uh, bad detection and basically nanoparticles are defined as particles with sizes between 1 uh, and 100 uh, nanometer right and due to the physical and chemical properties such as high surface uh, specific surface area electrical performance 
magnetism, optical and catalytic property, nanoparticles have received great attention. And uh, amongst those, uh, the one of the most stable metal nanoparticles will be the gold nanoparticles, which uh, have excellent properties such as compatibility. I already talked about this, and they can easily be modified uh, with biomolecules such as DNAs and RNAs by I think thiol and the amine via um, AUS and AUN, AU sulfur and AUN bonds without destroying the activity of the biomolecules. So that's why when I say great compatibility, that's what I mean. And in optical biosensors, uh, these gold nanoparticles are widely used to improve the detection sensitivity of fluorescence, chemical luminescence, and surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which um, Raman scattering method we talked about. Then surface resonance, surface plasma resonance, SPR technique, and other optical detection methods. And these gold nanoparticles are usually used as fluorescence quenchers, catalysts, immobilization platforms, colorimetric uh, nanoparticles, as well as SPR and SERS enhan enhancers in optical uh, biosensors. So it just goes on to show the optical uh, sensitivities of optical biosensors. Are effectively improved based on the signal amplification of gold nanoparticles. However, the uh, optical detections usually requiring expensive instruments such as fluorescence uh, spectrometers, all of these increases the cost of uh, bioassay. And in non optical biosensors, gold nanoparticles are mainly used in piezoelectric biosensors, electrochemical biosensors, and also ICPMS uh, biosensors. So, in piezoelectric biosensors, uh, gold nanoparticles usually act as labels which make use of their high density to increase the mass change and improve the sensitivity of detection. In electrochemical biosensors, gold nanoparticles are often used as immobilization platform, electrocatalyst or electron uh, migration enhancer which exhibits advantages in improving the sensitivity, selectivity and the stability of detection. And in recent years, uh, gold nanoparticles have also been reported in biological detection based on ICPMS data, ICPMS technology. And similar to optical biosensors, the performances of non-optical biosensors are also effectively improved based on the signal amplification of gold nanoparticles. So although the instruments of non-optical detection are simple, the detection procedures are not as automatic and rapid as those of optical biosensors, uh, which are not widely uh, using the clinical application and so all of these make this uh, gold nanoparticles uh, to be an extensive to be used extensively uh, in uh, biochemical sensors and they, uh, the other properties are also there such as tunable uh, surface plasmon resonance uh, distance dependent fluorescence quenching or enhancement high electrical conductivity exceptional light scattering properties and also they provide, uh, gold nanoparticles can also provide a very suitable microenvironment for biomolecule immobilization, retaining the biological activity. Those strategies for biomolecule binding to gold nanoparticles include the formation of capping layers of dual functionality uh, molecules capable of binding strongly to the gold surface and with a suitable chemical reactive group at the other end of the uh, other end uh, for further functionality. And this type of capping agent provides a convenient and very flexible and simple biological friendly environment for adsorption of various recognition elements to gold nanoparticle surfaces. And the need to detect and characterize biomolecules suitable for molecular diagnostics has prompted intense research and development towards the design of uh, these biosensors. And technological advancements have focused on the selective recognition with you know, relevant biomolecules uh, with high accuracy, ideally as simple, rapid and low point, low cost point of care biological devices. From the broad, broad spectrum biochemical sensors, strong preference has been devoted to those with a signal transduction. There is a colorimetric change of the medium, as I said over here, colorimetric change of the medium. And this is mainly a result of the relative ease of interpretation of data derived from intuitive assessment of, you know, results. And these have been extremely useful for the development of biosensors for analysis of active biomolecules relevant for human health and condition monitoring and diagnostics, food safety analysis and environmental monitoring. So in a simplified version, simplified vision, uh, gold nanoparticle based sensors are typically uh, constituted by recognition element coupled to gold nanoparticles, the latter being the 
you know transducers uh, on analyte binding generate a signaling transduction event and the bar recognition event pro provides a sensor specificity via biomolecules uh, capable of interacting with the analyte of interest and because these biomolecules may be of various types biochemical sensors may be also be classified according to their recognition element like uh, immunosensors for detection of antigens antibodies and proteins duplex acid sensors for dna and rna enzymatic sensors among others and they can also be classified uh, according to the relevant physiochemical property of the avnp transducer such as for instance you know uh, optical absorbance luminescence scattering plasma resonance or electrical electrochemical readout such as voltage potentiometric uh, semiconductor sensors magnetic uh semiconductor magnetic and uh, thermometric and so on so if if you go online and if you search there will be different sections talking about the effectiveness on um sensors on colorimetric sensing and how gold nanoparticles have been considered ideal platforms for uh, colorimetry sensing because they are extremely versatile easily synthesized in a wide range of sizes and shapes and can be modified with several chemical functional groups but above all they are unique optical properties such as high extension coefficient leading to intense colors and exceptionally intense scattering have been pivotal for the development of colorimetric biosensing strategies and optical behavior is strongly dependent on particle size and solutions containing small nanoparticles that are responsible for target analyte recognition and the analyte itself may promote or prevent aggregation of the gold nanoparticles and has been associated mainly with two distinct mechanisms um interparticle cross linking and non cross linking aggregation caused by the loss of colloidal stability so potential applications include identification of nucleic acid mutations associated with disease detection of gene expression and pathogens and detection of small molecules or ions and detection of proteins such as in immune detection and even in affinity binding so these are the potential uh, advantages of uh, having gold nanoparticles in your biosensing system so we'll stop here today if you have any questions from uh, whatever we discussed in today's class so it's almost uh, five so i'll stop presenting uh, we can stop here today if you don't have any questions from today's class or if you i uh, want to discuss something else and uh, maybe we can uh, conclude the session for today and we we'll, um, join in the next uh, live session next friday same link from 6 pm to 8 pm so any question okay. ma'am there is no any response for uh, from iit roorkee about that questions okay so uh, did you get any kind of mail or any kind of update on the discussion forum no no okay i every day i am looking for that but no any response okay i'll tell them again that uh, this issue has arisen uh, they said that they have uh, forwarded the issue and the concern to the uh, people who are managing the question and the website the portal uh, but okay i'll ask them to look into it once again no worries Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll stop the session today, and maybe we can meet uh, next Friday at six p.m. Same link. Mm -hmm.